I am CJ Wellerman, and this is Foreign Object, episode number seven. This is the show where a foreigner, me, examines America from the inside out. Today we'll be discussing the projection of American military and economic power in the oil-drenched Middle East. The US imperialist motive is a topic you won't hear mentioned in the mainstream media, and on a few occasions it is, it's cloaked in Orwellian euphemisms. You will hear the terms national interests, vital interests, and strategic interests, but the interests are never named. The US has only two interests in the Middle East. They are the sale of weapons and our access to the region's cheap oil supply. To protect these two interests, the US jealously protects the most despotic and autocratic regimes the world has ever known. 1.6 billion Muslims are not stupid. We do not pretend to prom promote democracy, nor are we trying to end terror. We are ensuring the US is a steady and ever supplyable supply of cheap oil, a Brookings Institute white paper forecasted that if the U.S. were to be cut off from Saudi Arabia's oil, the U.S. wouldn't have enough oil to meet its current demands within two to four years. There are now 44 U.S. military bases in the Middle East, some of which are the size of small cities. An aircraft carrier group parked permanently in the Gulf and an array of military outposts to ensure we dominate Middle, oil, Middle East oil supplies and Caspian Sea oil infrastructure. Our imperialistic interests are backed up with a sale of $55 billion worth of arms to the region, of which most end up in the arms of autocratic regimes such as Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Kuwait and Egypt. These weapons protect these regimes and monarchies from having to share the oil wealth with their citizens. There is so much to cover here and I'm grateful to have an expert on Middle East oil to break it all down for you. Antonio Juarez is an American oil and energy analyst, author, journalist and activist. She has authored three books, The Bush Agenda, The Tyranny of Oil, and Black Tide, and has contributed to CNN and MSNBC. In The Tyranny of Oil, Antonia investigates the true state of the U.S. oil industry, covering its virtually unparalleled global power, influence over elected officials, and its lack of regulatory oversight, exposing the in industry that thrives on secrecy. Antonia shows how big oil manages to hide its business dealings from policymakers, legislatures, and most of all, consumers. She reveals exactly how big oil gets what it wants through money, influence, and lies. Welcome to the show, Antonia. Thanks so much for having me. A pleasure to be with you. No, that's terrific. Now, let, let's start with an easy one and uh, one that's always uh, always contentious. The uh, Iraq War version 2003, was that uh, motivated by oil or not? Yeah, right now it's, it's just so sad that we have to go through, uh, you know, version versions by year and versions by presidents, but yeah, version 2003. Um, I, I do not argue that oil was the only motivator, but certainly a key motivator. And um, one of the things that has actually changed over the history of U.S. Middle East policy, which was particularly pronounced under the Bush administration, is that while I agree for, for most of U.S. history, that, that what the U.S. government has been interested in is a cheap supply of oil. With the Iraq war, the, it, I would argue that the objectives of the Bush administration were actually much more directly aligned with the oil industry itself. And that was to gain access for U.S. oil companies to, uh, for, to Iraqi oil fields, which is not the same thing as making sure Americans have oil, not at all. Rather, it's making sure that oil companies make a lot of money, and that was very successfully done. So prior to the 2003 invasion, the United States and Western oil companies had been completely shut out of Iraq for some 40 years um, as a direct result of those companies controlling Iraq's oil industry for a very long time and the Iraqis rebelling and kicking them out. And some very, from the perspective of the oil industry and the Bush administration, some very disturbing things were happening. And that was most importantly that uh, in 2000 and 2001, most importantly in 2000, Saddam Hussein had started for the first time negotiating oil contracts with foreign oil companies, but none of those oil companies were from the United States instead or the West. They were from countries that sat on the Security Council. And what that meant was that Saddam Hussein was essentially um, dangling lucrative oil contracts, opening up his country for the first time to foreign companies for the first time in decades, and saying, if you want to take advantage of these contracts, foreign oil companies, you have to lift the sanctions that the Security Council is imposing. So what we saw was that the Bush administration came into power 
And all of that oil was about to go to everybody but us. Mm. Fast forward one invasion, many lives and many deaths later, much destruction later, and all of the major Western oil companies now have production contracts for some of the largest oil fields in the world in Iraq and Kurdistan, thanks to the invasion of Iraq. Yeah, that's that's. I I think that's uh, I think that's a spot on assessment. And uh, I, I guess what you uh, what you've, I've always heard thrown in along with that argument is also the fear that that uh, the U.S. had that Saddam was uh, threatening to price uh, his oil in euro. Uh, and in fact, I think it was uh, uh, it was uh, John Chapman, who was the, the British assistant, the Secretary of Civil Service, um, wrote in a, an op-ed title titled "The Real Reasons Bush Went to War," and he said the uh, worldwide switches out of the dollar on top of the already huge deficit would have led to a pummeling of the U.S. dollar, a runaway from U.S. markets, and dr dramatic upheavals in the U.S. Is it, it speak to that a little bit. Is that something you're familiar with? Yeah, it is. I mean, I think that was certainly. An issue, I don't think it was particularly likely that Hussein was going to be capable of you know, switching uh, the global marketplace, the, the global pricing um, from dollars for oil. Um, but it was certainly on the list. So, you know, like I said, there was a list of reasons that made it possible for, you know, all of the people within the Bush administration, their supporters, to make, the to make it possible to lead this administration into war. And there's a long list of issues that make that possible. I think very high on that list is oil. And then there are, you know, subcategories of that. And so one of those would certainly be, be pricing of oil. But I think that really the most important thing was there was about to be a big, you know, payoff in oil and we were about to be shut out of it. And in it, you know, and moreover, gaining access to oil is also, you know, it's, also, it's not just about what you get, it's about what you deny. So, of course, the United States wasn't interested in seeing Saddam Hussein get wealthy in partnership with countries that weren't our friends. For example, China and Russia would have been on the top of that list. Um, and that would have empowered Hussein even more. And so by denying um, Hussein that power and putting in the power that, that those oil sales afforded him, um, in particular what would have been the end of the Security Council sanctions, um, the United States is also using oil as a weapon, um, you know, what is withheld from Hussein and getting rid of Hussein and putting in a government that was more supportive of U.S. interests in particular, um, dramatically changing the structure with which um, Iraq dealt with foreign oil companies and opening up Iraq to, to U.S. and Western, other Western oil companies. So, so how influential is big oil as, as far as uh, foreign policy, on, on immediate policy? It's incredibly powerful, but what's interesting is that um, the Obama administration is not the Bush administration. So, you know, the Bush administration was really part and parcel to the oil industry. Um, George Bush, his longest work experience before moving into the government had been working in the oil industry and the only other US president to come out of the oil industry was Bush's father and we had Dick Cheney the head of Halliburton the largest energy services company in the world we had Condoleezza Rice who had been on the board of Chevron um, we really had a government where the oil industry no longer had to lobby to see its interests met it just had to legislate to see its interests met and it, and it did very well um, see those policies aggressively put forward across the country and across the world. Now, the oil industry is still incredibly powerful and influential in the U.S. government and in the Obama administration, but not in the same way. And I think that's evidenced by the fact that this administration is deeply conflicted on how to deal with war in uh, Iraq, war in the Middle East, how to go about meeting um, a wide variety of, object of, of objectives that are actually competing within this administration. And that's part of why we've seen it sort of fledge uh, in many ways um, when it comes to um, how, it's, how it is responding to renewed war, uh, in you know, extending the war in Afghanistan, expanding the war in Iraq, but doing it in this very haphazard way. 
Um, and I think that's part of it is that, that there isn't such a clear um, industrial backing of this administration as there was of the Obama administration and of the Bush administration, which had no, you know, the Obama, the Bush administration was very clear. Mm-hmm. It had imperial aims. It wrote about very clearly using the word empire, its desire for empire, all of the members of the um, Bush administration before they came into office um, that were part of the project for the New American Century were very explicit that the United States needed to be expand itself as an empire, and they had no qualms about that being their objective. This administration, in fact, does, but that hasn't stopped it from being imperial. Yeah, no. Yeah, no they, and as you said, this is a deeply conflicted administration. Um, exactly. They take two steps forward and one step back, and they always seem to be second-guessing themselves and, and seem to be at, at war within, uh, you know, as we've seen with the ousting of, uh, of Chuck Hagel. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting. It's always interesting. Uh, James Risen, I don't know if you've read his new book, Pay Any Price. Halfway through. <laughs> oh, okay, there you go. Well, <laughs> it's, very, it's top of mind for you, so you know, you know what I'm talking about. And, mm-hmm. and he, what, you know, what's the, you know, the thing that stands out most alarming in that book is particularly in the early chapters, and he talks about Iraq and, the, you know, Iraq's missing billion, you know, Iraq's missing billions, mm-hmm. is that, that today... Um, and you kind of touched on this today. You, 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 you know, an observer really can't tell where the state ends and corporations begin, and and this has been, you know, as part of we've outsourced, you know, the military uh, to these private corporations. So private corporations don't have national interests in mind; they only have the pursuit of profit in mind. So, and, he, and James Risen talks about the classic case in the book where the drone manufacturers, the Blue Brothers. Um, based in La Jolla, California, um, who have been the, one of the biggest benef- you know, benefactors of the war on terror. Uh, the CIA have been helping them try and set up these offshore companies to, uh, to enable the sale of drones to you know, the likes of Hezbollah and so forth in the Middle East, uh, you know, entities which are our stated enemies. When, and and those, kind of, um, those kind of sales would you know, be game changers as far as um, the dynamics, the, the, how the dynamics play out in these countries. So it kind of sh- it drives to the heart of how much influence these corporations have over the imperialist motive. Is that how the way you're reading his book? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I yeah. think that um, what what's very clear is that these 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 corporations don't have U.S. interests in mind. They also, you know, don't even have global interests in mind. Certainly, if you look at oil companies doubling down on their pursuit of the most dangerous, uh, risky sources of oil at a time when all scientists uh, who study these issues have confirmed that what we need to do is leave fossil fuels in the ground, so they don't even have the Earth's <laughs> interest in mind. But certainly from a political perspective, it's not an American uh, set of goals that are um, their objective. And I think for the oil industry, what they are most interested in in Iraq and in the Middle East more broadly is is access, pure and simple access under the best terms possible. But that also includes stability. So I think one of the things that's interesting is is just today we heard that um, Kurdistan and Iraq have uh, finally reached an agreement over their dispute over who owns oil. Does Kurdistan own its oil or does the central Iraqi government own its oil? And this has been a long simmering dispute. And I would actually argue that when the Obama administration first used airstrikes in this latest iteration of the U.S. war in Iraq, those airstrikes only happened when Islamic State threatened Kurdistan, actually threatened um, sizable oil holdings held by U.S. and other Western oil companies. It wasn't until those fields were targeted and Kurdistan was put at risk that U.S. airstrikes begin began. But the Obama administration also used those airstrikes to put pressure on the central Iraqi government to start making changes that the administration wanted to see. And I think through a long negotiation that's obviously been going on for the last six months between Kurdistan and the central Iraqi government, they've finally come to an agreement on one of these most contentious issues, which was oil and who owns the oil and how decisions are made. And that agreement puts, I think, to rest um, a lot of a lot of people who had argued that what was ultimately desired um, by the Obama administration or by the U.S. government was a separate Kurdistan. 
And I argued against that because I think at the end of the day, what the industry wants is stability. And had you have a had you had a military conflict with independence between Kurdistan and a central Iraqi government, it just would have been more war, more instability, and less access to oil fields. So I think they the oil industry does want Islamic State put down. It does want uh, Iraq and Kurdistan to find um, peace, and it does want whatever gains it access and then stability to make to make use of that access and it doesn't care you know ideologically what those governments stand for it doesn't care if that oil makes its way back to the united states at all um it doesn't care you know who whose interests are served except for that it gets to produce oil what what percentage give give a breakdown of uh, oil, uh, Iraq's oil production? What percentage is coming out of uh, Kurdistan in the north, and as, as opposed to um, in the southern oil fields? A teeny tiny percent, but what is and I don't know the exact number, but it's a oh. fraction because the vast majority of oil is coming from the south. That's where um, the major U.S. and British holdings are as well. Mm -hmm. um, but what's what's important about Kurdistan, in addition to having sizable fields, the most important being the Kirkuk oil field, which the Kurds actually took as a result of Islamic State trying to go after the Kirkuk field. Uh, the Kurds, their, their military arm, the Peshmerga, pushed Islamic State back and for the first time took over that vital field, which is, which is a huge field. And I think because they had that field is why they were able to come to this pressure, help pressure the central Iraqi government to come to this agreement with them. Um, but what's important about Kurdistan is that the Bush administration and, and U.S. oil companies spent eight years trying to pressure the central Iraqi government to turn over the most liberal terms possible for the types of contracts they could get in Iraq. The central Iraqi government didn't let that happen. It gave them access, but not the perfect access that they wanted. Mm. The Kurds did give that access. So the contracts that are being offered in Kurdistan are really, you know, the, the best wished for model that the foreign oil companies want. So they wanted to see that area protected. They wanted to see those contracts protected because they ultimately want to see that model spread throughout the rest of Iraq and, Iraq and the rest of the region. But, but does, the, does the fact that the central uh, Iraqi government in Baghdad being controlled effectively, being a proxy state effectively for the Iranian regime, doesn't that threaten America's access to... Uh, oil if, if, uh, if the Iranian regime is out to expand its uh, control over the, r the remainder of Iraq? Yeah, well, therein lies, you know, one of the difficulties. I think peace in Iraq is dependent upon the Iranians actually getting to have, applying even more influence to forcing the Shia to actually provide a more liberal and open environment for the Sunnis. Without that, the Sunnis are going to continue to um, hate the central government, fight for their slice of peace, and they are going to, at this point, continue to side with Islamic State. The, 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 the pro uh, in the argument that Iran would join um, in trying to create a better Iraqi government is that a more inclusive Iraqi government is that the Iranians don't want that instability. They don't want Islamic State either. They don't want that instability moving into their country. Mm -hmm. They would like to see a stable. Again, it's, you know, stability is important um, uh, for lots of reasons and it's important for the Iranians as well. They would like to not they would like to see a more stable Iraq. And the only way there's going to be a more stable Iraq is if it has a more inclusive government. And so that's in the interests of the Iranians and it's in the interests of the Americans, but of course, only up to a point, only up to the yeah. point where that government still does what we want the government to do. So therein lies the, the problem of uh, democracy and transparency. Um, once you create a more inclusive government, that government's more likely to do things that those who want to control it don't want it to do. So we want uh, inclusiveness up to a point. The Iranians want inclusiveness up to a point. And at the end of the day, um, you know, the, 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 big, the big victory, the big goal uh, for, for not just ourselves but for others are those very, very large um, pots of oil.
And um, so what percentage of, of uh, Middle Eastern, what percentage of America's total oil uh, needs are being met by the Middle East oil production at the moment? Well, it's all, it fluctuates uh, daily at this point because of the conflict over uh, the increase in production from fracked oil um, that has led to a huge boom in domestic U.S. production. In addition to, so uh, um, a lot of policy changes that were made during the Bush administration uh, and continued in the Obama administration opened up lots of the United States to increase production that hadn't been happening before. Um, so it's not only fracked oil, but also um, increased oil from offshore and deep offshore uh, production, very dangerous production, as is fracked oil. Um, that has now that surge uh, in production is shifting uh, how much the United States imports from elsewhere. Um, we're also importing more from Canada, but the Saudis are actively trying to undermine the price of domestic oil production, so they are cheapening the price of their oil as it gets exported into uh, specific markets, including the United States. So OPEC just met uh, in the last several days, and many of the OPEC governments that are completely dependent on their oil tried to call for a reduction in their production because the world is using less oil. This is something we want to keep doing. Uh, we're using less oil. Demand is down. Production is up, uh, and the countries that are really dependent on production on the, on oil want to reduce how much they reduce the amount that they produce, but they need to do it together. Many of the countries wanted to do that, but Saudi Arabia refused because Saudi Arabia can withstand a lower price of oil, a significantly lower price of oil, and still have all the money that it needs. So it is currently trying to um, gain a greater foothold within the U.S. market in an attempt to. A, a, a literal attempt to try to destroy the um, domestic cracking market. So those those numbers are are are, are changing regularly. But we, um, as as I have last seen the numbers, we have basically continued to have a steady um, a steady input of oil from Iraq, not a sudden spike um, as U.S. companies started producing there, and not a sudden decline, but a steady flow. Just staying on this uh, fracking for a moment, is 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 this a sustainable market for the U.S.? I mean, uh, there's the numbers that I've seen, um, and I think it was put out by the, uh, the International Energy Agency, and, and they said it takes approximately 2,500 wells per year to maintain production of 1 million barrels per day in North Dakota, whereas it only takes 60 wells per year to maintain the same level of oil production in Iraq. Um, so, you know, with, with oil plunging to the price it is, is, is this fracking... Is you know the the shale boom? Is this something that can be sustained, or do you think Saudi Arabia uh, will get its way in in destroying uh, this economy? I think in terms of pricing, that's not going to be an issue. I've seen numbers that some of the cheaper wells, and some of these are very cheap to produce uh, in 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 the United States, in North Dakota, in Pennsylvania, and Texas, can be as cheap as twenty five dollars per barrel and still be worthwhile uh, to the companies. Um, more common numbers are forty dollars a barrel. We're not going to get that low. We might get down to sixty uh, or so. But also, most estimates are that the fracked oil um, boom is a is a is a big bubble, and there's not that much um, oil and natural gas to get using fracking, and that that's going to dry up very very quickly, and that we're going to put a lot of money and a lot of environmental destruction, and a lot of uh, laws are going to get changed to you know, leak, allow this boom to take place, and then it's going to dry up very quickly. I think that's quite possible. Um, I, I think more importantly, um, we're supposed to be working towards leaving oil and natural gas and coal in the ground. That's the direction that the world needs to be moving. The you know, United Nations is meeting in Lima right now, trying to work out still yet another climate agreement. And just before they met, the United Nations put out its most, I think, um, extreme call yet saying uh, the majority of the world's fossil fuels must stay in the ground if we're going to avert the worst of climate catastrophe. And, you know, that's the direction we need to be moving in. So, you know, cheap gasoline today has extreme costs, um, not only for people who live in 
in the places where oil is produced and fought for. Let's not forget this conversation began, of course, with war. Mm. Um, places where it's produced, where it's fought for, where it's transported, where it's refined. Um, but in the you know obviously in the long run has very or even the short run has very extreme consequences for our climate, um, and that needs to be um, I think the framework within which we look at these uh, discussions of whether we should be you know protecting uh, domestic fracking so that we are less dependent on foreign sources of oil. I think the most important thing is that we just become less dependent on oil. Period. Not. Um, where it's coming from. And that will ultimately help us reduce the desire or the um, tendency to continue to fight wars where oil is a key element of those wars. So, so with, with the price of oil, you know, continuing its downward trend, what's going to be the overall impact in the Middle East in general? You know, I guess starting with Saudi Arabia. You said Saudi Arabia would be able to withstand, um, uh, you know, this price plunge given... Well, I, I believe they have five hundred billion dollars in cash reserves offset. Exactly. To, yeah, to uh, to <laughs> ride, yeah to ride out this sort of storm. But what about the smaller uh, producers in OPEC uh, that have uh, you know have had to you know in response to the Arab Spring, Spring have had to uh, raise their domestic spending to uh, to placate you know uh, citizenry, citizenry through um, you know increased government uh, spending through uh, infrastructure, um, health and and welfare and so forth. Um, what, what's going to be the pressure, say, I think I saw the UAE now or Kuwait, you know, their break-even is at $80 per barrel, I believe. Um, are we looking at you know, increased pressure for more social chaos in, in some of these countries? Well, you know, there's trouble on both sides of, of, the, um, of the issue of, of oil, the price of oil going down versus the price of oil going up. So, you know, when oil went to um, $100 a barrel in 2008, that was the moment when the economic recession began because the countries that purchase oil can't afford the high, that high price of oil and it put enormous pressure on every other part of the economy because oil was so expensive that that one part of the budget was eating up so many government dollars that there wasn't money to spend elsewhere. And I, you know, even more so than the mortgage crisis I believe the real tipping point was the price of oil um, being too hardwired into our global economy. So for purchasing countries, a lower price for oil is good. For producing countries, a lower price of oil is very problematic. And again, um, you know, that's where at the end of the day that the issue needs to be, you know, how do we get off of this oil seesaw? Um, where our global economy needs to not be so dependent on what happens to the price of this one resource. But certainly for countries like, you know, poorer countries, um, Venezuela, Brazil, Ecuador, countries that I think are very problematically trying to develop on uh, the back of oil, a low price for oil is deeply problematic to uh, their commitment to social programs based on an oil income, which is why using that as a development model is a deeply problematic model. Um, uh, there are vagaries within uh, um, the oil market. So, for example, one of the reasons why oil spiked in the last two days is because energy traders started trading oil. And traders, some people have estimated can, can have an influence over as much as 50% of the price of a barrel of oil. That's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. So they started pushing the price back up. Again, you know, this is just a resource that um, is very, very, very problematic. Uh, and there's very little regulation. There's very little oversight. Um, and uh, the, the impacts for ec economies are obviously quite extreme. Yeah, I, one of the I guess one of the troubling aspects of the, of the you know one of the nice aspects is uh, you've seen BP's uh, share price tumble by I think about twenty five percent in the last few months, which I always take encouragement from. But, <laughs> but uh, you're going to see a movement away. What I always hate when oil uh, the price of oil plunges, you see the SUVs back on the road, and yeah, exactly. uh, you know we we uh, we we go through this. These cycles of talking about renewable energies, you know, talking about moving towards the electric car when you know uh, the price of oil is at one hundred and fifty dollars a barrel. But as soon as it comes back to sixty or seventy dollars, and it's back to the 
you know, back to the uh, the Hummers and and so forth. So we no, I mean we've we've put forward extremely good policies within the United States for fuel efficiency standards, um, and and people um, desiring more fuel efficient cars. One reason w was the you know high price of oil, the economic um, collapse, but also people genuinely wanting to see greener um, alternatives and shifting towards greener alternatives. And I am a very strong advocate of the fact that oil should be priced higher, gasoline should be priced higher, but we also have to move, we have to, public policy has to fill in the void. You can't just suddenly um, make it so that people can't afford the things they need to do. So you need to have, you know, if you're going to increase the price of gasoline, which we should, um, and that moves people towards greener alternatives, you have to continue that policy. So we need, you know, huge investments in public transportation. We need huge investments in green technologies to share with developing countries. Um, in Ecuador, uh, the president Carrera had proposed saving the Yasuni National Forest, which is one of the most important pristine um, biological uh, sources in the world of biological diversity. Um, there's oil there, and he had said, "Okay, if the world doesn't want us to produce oil." And to produce it from this incredibly important natural global natural resource, then pay us, and then we'll use that money to fund the things that we would have funded with the oil. And the world didn't do that. So if we're going to price oil and gas as it should remain priced, there has to be a whole suite of policy alternatives that fill in the void, and that makes oil and also makes oil less um, attractive and less vital and makes it so it's not a tool of war. So if we go back to Iraq, the Islamic State is using oil as a very key and very effective tool of war. One of the reasons why is that people in the region are in, are in the middle of this incredible oil wealth, but individuals have a very hard time actually gaining access to fuel because uh, about 80% of Iraq's oil is exported out of the country. Um, to, a, to many, many governments, not just the United States, but is exported out of the country. And the Iraqis have a very difficult time getting fuel. The same is true in Syria and other countries uh, in the Middle East. And so Islamic State is taking over oil fields and selling that oil to make money, but also providing fuel, which is one of the ways that it's gaining adherence and support. Uh, 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 I'm glad you brought up the Islamic State, because that's where I wanted to steer the conversation next to. So how is the Islamic State uh, offloading uh, the oil that they're able to get their hands on onto the black market. How, what is the avenue for them? Yeah, it's been really amazing to watch this unfold. I mean, Islamic State is trying to build a state. That is what makes them very different from other um, non-state terrorist actors. And to do that in the Middle East, you need oil. So they have slowly taken over fields in Syria, taken over some smaller fields in northern Iraq, and they are also taking over what were very ancient, actually, smuggling networks where, you know, there's very um, low-tech refineries. They've been trying to get their hands on major refineries, the Bahi refinery in particular in Iraq, but they have thus far not succeeded to get that and get it running. Um, but they've been mostly using these very um, low-tech refineries. And the oil gets moved in trucks, and I've even heard on donkeys, and it gets moved through um, very old smuggling networks that go to Turkey, um, to Syria, to Kurdistan, um, and either get just used along the way, um, or I've even seen recently that uh, larger quantities are moving their way out into the global oil network. Uh -huh. And the numbers are estimated that Islamic State is making about a million dollars, at the high point it was estimated it was making two million dollars per day from the illicit sale of oil and now um, the airstrikes did actually specifically target US airstrikes, some oil infrastructure and now, now those estimates are down to about a million dollars a week which is still an incredible amount of money. Mm. And the US Treasury Department last month, for the first time, announced that it was targeting this network, which for me, I have thought, you know, that's great, but why so late? Why did we, you know, bomb first and ask questions later, but okay, at least we're at the table. Um, the U.S. Treasury Department has 
now has a campaign focused on trying to stop these smuggling networks, track the money, stop the money, track the banks where the money ultimately ends up. Um, and to me, that is the clearest and simplest way to undermine Islamic State is to get rid of their their primary funding source, which is oil, but not to do it militarily. You don't want to start blowing up people's oil and gasoline supplies when those are something that people are very dependent upon uh, and you don't want to blow things up because that kills people, but rather through police actions, through financial actions um, by locals, you could start you know, really undermining Islamic State's power. And the fact that we're bombing first and asking questions later is, of course, um, emblematic of a very failed set of, of policy options that the Obama administration seems to believe that it's constrained by. Yeah, and so, so with, with, with U.S. Um, oil production up and, and the price falling, do you, do you see that um, in the Obama administration that they're wanting to decouple themselves from the Middle East? Do you, do you believe that's a, uh, that's a strategic goal, or you believe that they're so conflicted they don't know what they want? Yeah, no, I mean, it's different. Um, part of it, partly it's different oil companies, for one thing, so it's not... Um, I don't think the United States would ever decouple itself from the Middle East. We obviously have other interests in the Middle East that aren't just oil um, and many others. Um, we also have imperial goals. Um, so uh, oil is is very much a part of that mix, but it's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, for the for, well, for the oil industry, they don't care where the oil comes from. They just they want oil. They want all the oil. They want any oil, <laughs> any oil, all the oil. It doesn't matter if it's American oil, if it's Iraqi oil. It doesn't matter. They want all of it. So sure. um, that increased domestic oil production means nothing to them. Also, a lot of the companies that are doing the fracking in the United States are tiny companies, um, and some have been consolidated. Exxon bought uh, another company called XTO, which was a domestic fracker. Um, but some of the bigger companies, on the whole, have sort of stayed more out of the domestic fracking industry because I think they see that it's short term, and their interests are much um, bigger and, uh, um, yeah, much bigger. Really, would just be the, the bottom line and, and longer term. But uh, yeah, I, I think that um, the Obama administration is certainly not interested in decoupling itself from the Middle East. Yeah. Sure. But I think it is interested in. Um, not having the same type of military footprint as the Bush administration had. Yeah, I, it's interesting. Uh, Robert Kaplan, uh, and I, I was just reading a piece of his uh, earlier in the week, and, and he's a, a geopolitical analyst, and he, he believes that um, we're going to become, the U.S. is going to become less focused on the Middle East going forward. And, and, and I think you even said it yourself, that China, China and Russia and India and going to become more of a um, more of an oil trading partner, so to speak, than what the U.S. has been for the last fifty years. Um, and mm -hmm. he, he believes that the the Middle East is more or less going to become a, a channel for their hydrocarbons into uh, you know China and India. It's possible. I mean, yeah. uh, certainly um, the Chinese. Uh, have gotten the largest stake of Iraqi oil uh, as a result of the war. The Russians are also in there. That's also a sort of complicated history, which was that Saddam Hussein did, in fact, sign contracts with the Chinese and Russians. And when the war, when the U.S. invasion happened, the Chinese and Russians said, hey, look, we've already got contracts. We don't care that, you know, you kicked out the guy who we signed them with. We have these contracts. And so the American companies and the British companies essentially squirmed their way into the pre-existing contracts that the Russians and uh, the Chinese had and got some of their own contracts. But the Chinese have certainly gotten the most out of it. Um, I spent a fair amount of time romping through Afghanistan looking at places where there's oil and natural gas there. And the Pentagon was in charge of trying to open up those fields and, and was trying to get... American companies interested, but it was just too unstable and not enough of a potential reward, and instead the Chinese uh, are the ones that have come in. Um, the Chinese, you know, have an even more voracious appetite than we do, and um, because it's a, they are state-owned uh, state companies, um, they don't need as much, they don't need to, to make as much um, in, their, in their contract deals. Um, so they can under underprice uh, other foreign companies, um, but you know I think uh, 
I think American companies would fight very hard to uh, yeah. try and maintain a foothold uh, in the Middle East. And again, you know, oil isn't the only isn't the only factor and, in and these decisions. Sure, and, and also and, um, I, that's a question I meant to ask earlier was um, you know, on Russia. Um, surely this must just cripple Russia. And Russia has been the prick in America's backside for you know the last well or for all of the Obama presidency. Um, and well, I think 75% of Russia's GDP is based on oil and gas. This, this must be stifling for them. And it, there's, there's many uh, political commentators who believe that, that uh, I don't believe it, I believe it's false, and I'm sure you do too, that, that, that it's the OPEC and uh, the US in cahoots uh, to bring the price of oil down to strangle uh, Russia. Do you, do you believe there's any merit in that argument? Or do you just think that's a side benefit? Yeah, uh, I, I don't think so because I don't think uh, OPEC has a coordinated response. And, and OPEC hasn't had, basically ever since the energy traders took over, OPEC's pricing ability has been severely undercut. Um, so traders, starting in the mid-80s, really increasingly took over the price-setting ability that OPEC once held. Um, the... Obama administration also doesn't control U.S. oil companies. U.S. oil companies control the Obama administration, if anyone has a more powerful position in that relationship. Um, but I do think that Russia is certainly very, very hurt. Um, with you, when you add the, the fall in the price of oil to the sanctions, uh, Russia is definitely going to feel the pain uh, of this of, of this outcome. Um, and if the, you know, traders have anything to do about it, the price will move up. But I mean, I think, um, the argument that it's a conspiracy is pretty dramatically undercut by the fact that Saudi Arabia isn't abiding by yeah. a, a pullback. Saudi Arabia is, is producing more. So, um, for sure. Yeah, as far as I know, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't make sense. Oh, uh, we yeah. can let we can let the conspiracy theorists wax lyrical on that one. Yeah. As as like. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Antonio, this has been a great uh, great discussion. I find this kind of stuff, uh, you know, so uh, so interesting. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, the dollar dictates everything. America is, you know, as I've written about extensively, it has become a corporate totalitarian state. And you know, big oil, you know, the most profitable corporations on on the planet, them and the weapons manufacturers. And then when you put that in light of, uh, you know, our interest in the Middle East, somebody like you can really shine a, a light on exactly the, you know, the ins and outs of, uh, of how that works. So, so for my listeners, if they want to find your books, where is the best place to, uh, to find your stuff? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, my website is the best spot, and that's my name, AntoniaUhas.net, which is A-N-T-O-N-I-A-J-U-H-A-S-Z. Dot net. Um, and thanks very much. I certainly enjoy uh, discussing these topics as well, so I appreciate the time and the opportunity to talk. Yeah, great. And also, a, a quick apology. I, I, I pronounced your, uh, your after <laughs> after we had the conversation <laughs> off air, and I, and I mangled your name up in the introduction. So, who has? There it is. I got nope. it right that time. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, thanks. thanks a lot, Antonio. You have a good one. Thank you. You too. All the best. Bye-bye.